couple of ground rules before we start with Q&A. Um, we're going to pass around some cards, if you didn't grab one at the back table, that you can write your questions on. What I'd like to do is I'll call in someone from the audience who would like to voice their question, and then I'll try to intersperse that with one of the cards, so we'll go back and forth. I'd ask that you take and get an opportunity to ask a question, maybe wait until we get around the room a little bit, and then if it seems like there aren't others and you have more questions, feel free then. But someone, please don't try to dominate the whole thing. We want to get everybody a chance to say something. I think our questions now are going to be mainly for Ellen and Carol. But the committee is here. You were introduced to them at the beginning. And I think at the end of this, most of them are going to be around the back entry, uh, back of the room. And they'd be happy to answer some of your questions more specifically about this region. For sure. Uh, one, if the town is facing infrastructure loss due to erosion uh, related to higher water in the lake right now, um, are there restrictions on what they can do to protect their infrastructure, strip wrap perhaps, or some other shoreline structure that would be protected? The other question is, where is the boundary in the lake uh, of the sanctuary in relation to backflows associated with sanctuaries? Two questions. One about uh, where is that boundary uh, for the sanctuary and the other about what can a town do with regard to protecting perhaps loss from erosion or something like that um, within the sanctuary area. I'll deal with the boundary question first. Um, so the boundary in the Great Lakes would uh, typically go to the ordinary high water mark. In the oceans we have the ability to look at tidal influence but uh, without having a tidal influence here I guess the SAGE is, is an interesting question. Um, and I've talked to the committee about some possible flexibility in, in how we would look at that. But generally, the ordinary high water mark. Um, the infrastructure? This is one of those tricky questions. It's, it's, it depends. And so you're very early in the designation process with this, or nomination process. So it's hard to say exactly at this point. For the sanctuary I manage, we um, go to the mean low, low water mark where we overlap tribal reservations and mean higher high water mark. And so and essentially I have no uh, development on the coast that has that type of um, structures on it. But it would really depend how the regulations are written. Often they'll include provisions for allowing for you know, dredging or emergency uh, repairs is often a common feature that you see. So it's kind of difficult to answer that at this point without knowing what the boundaries of the sanctuary are or the, the regulations. But it's, it's certainly that, something that can be discussed in the future. Thank you. I'm going to go with one question from a card. Uh, what is the primary designation of this sanctuary, and what new regulations would be imposed? Uh, in terms of what new regulations would be imposed, uh, that would be down the line. Um, you know, the first step is to submit the nomination and have the nomination accepted to our inventory, and it's really at the um, if we get to that next phase of the designation process where we, we deal with all of those in very specific terms, where we are, we're writing the environmental impact statement, writing the regulations, determining what the scope of management is. Um, the nomination will set forth your general vision for what you see the possibilities for a sanctuary, but doesn't really get that specific. So without having to you know, completely punt on that question, it is true that without having the, you know, the explicit details of, that we will get through, um, get to in a designation process, we just can't answer that. What we can do is talk about what we do in other sanctuaries. I can talk about what we do in a shipwreck sanctuary like Thunder Bay, and Carol can talk about Olympic Coast. And we have some similarities in other sanctuaries, um, but that particular one, just don't know. So, for example, in the sanctuary that I manage, we have um, 
seafloor disturbance regulations. We have an overflight regulation that governs uh, low flights over some of the offshore islands and rocks. Um, we have prohibitions on disturbing cultural resource sites. Um, and there is a prohibition on water quality impacts um, that would affect the quality of the sanctuary. So those are examples of some of the regulations that we have for Olympic Coast, but that was after a lot of discussion and looking at um, where there were gaps with um, other regulatory structures and figuring that this is the place that we could um, add value. Um, we're not really about duplicating other people's authorities. Yeah, I would like to emphasize that part about not duplicating other authorities. I mean, one example is in the designation of the Thunder Bay Sanctuary, uh, because again, looking at state waters, uh, we looked at the existing state of Michigan law for shipwreck protection. And there was, we got a lot of feedback that we don't want uh, two different sets of regulations that kind of say the same thing but use different language. So we ended up uh, mirroring, mirroring the state of Michigan regulations for protecting shipwrecks. But we also added, I had that prohibitions up on the screen, we added the third prohibition, which is that if there is a mooring buoy, you can't use an anchor or a grappling hook. So we had both the, um, I mean, this sort of duplicating, but not duplicating, uh, but also the value added. So those are the things that we'll be looking at. Proposal for a confined animal feeding operation in the watershed. One of the questions is wondering if that's in effect before the nomination goes through with that impact, whether or not we could have a sanctuary. I think the other card was looking at um, could sanctuary designation stop something like that in the future? So those might be loaded questions, but see if you can uh, try them. <laughs> okay, well, I have heard about this and had some discussions with uh, members of the committee. And this is a tough one. And maybe I'll, okay, so the first question was, would, could there be a sanctuary if there was the, the CAFO? And yes, I mean, there are threats to other sanctuaries. That's not a reason to, you know, per se, not to have a national marine sanctuary. Do um, you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think you really, hopefully, like CAFO, is that the acronym? Okay. That would not um, impact the qualities of the area that you're looking at um, to the extent that you would say doesn't meet that national standard. So I, I think that would be highly unlikely. Um, depends on what impacts it has, but I, I would I have a hard time imagining that it would. So the second question was whether the sanctuary would stop, be able to stop the CAFO. Is that right? Yes. All right, well, so our regulations do address impacts to sanctuary resources from outside the sanctuary. Um, so if they can demonstrate that it's, you know, damage is occurring from an activity, whether it's terrestrial or um, in the waters outside the sanctuary, theoretically, we, we can address that in some capacity. Um, in our decades of managing sanctuaries, we are better tested at the activities that are outside the boundary but are in the water. For example, um, oil and gas development. Um, the closest that we come in addressing impacts in the watershed, terrestrial, I think are at Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, where the, the sanctuary program is very engaged in working with uh, farmers and landowners to, to minimize the adverse impacts from those practices on the sanctuary. Um, it's, it can be difficult to make the, the case that a particular activity is, is harming a sanctuary resource. I'm not saying that we can't do it. I'm saying that it can be difficult to do. Could I add one component to that question, which maybe might help a little bit? You have a roadmap up here with, I think, a couple of years of time to get to a certain point. What's the overall time span 
from we're on step one to actually being designated. Right. So that roadmap was just to get to the nomination, you know, to get to the inventory. It depends on how much, you know, well, it can take a while or it can, it can go pretty quickly. Um, you know, we're, we'll work with you however long it takes. I mean, I personally believe that it takes as long as you need it to take because sometimes it takes more time to build community support and to talk to people about what the sanctuary program does and what it doesn't. Um, when I worked with the Lake Michigan communities in Wisconsin, I mean, they, they have been seeing me for about seven or eight years, so this was not a new concept to them. Um, but for you, and just learning about it, you may not be ready right now to say, yeah, I'm ready to write a letter of support. Um, so there's no deadline for submitting a nomination, so I guess that's one part of it. We don't have, you know, all nominations must be submitted by December 31st, 2016. So it's kind of an ongoing uh, process. Once a nomination is submitted to NOAA, we do have, you know, X amount of months to make a decision on that. Um, you know, first we, we review it for sufficiency and then we look at the national significance. But we can turn them around pretty quickly. Once it's on the inventory, it can stay there for five years. Um, and we can act on it any time um, in that five-year period. Thank you.